So we have uh, Pat and Indra here to help us through this conversation today. Just by way of introduction, Indra is founder and co-initiator of the Alternative Global, a socio-political platform serving systemic transformation. Alt Global publishes a daily alternative news blog, develops Cosmo Local Agency Networks, CANS, and connects planetary regeneration projects. Indra is concurrently a socio-psychotherapist, writer and consultant on soft power. Clients have included, this list is mind-blowing, uh, the Danish and Brazilian governments, World Economic Forum and NATO. Her book, book The Politics of Waking Up, Power and Possibility in the Fractal Age, was a Times Literary Supplement Book of the Year in 2021. And joining Indra today is Pat Kane. Pat is a writer, musician, consultant, and activist. He wrote The Play Ethic in 2004, and now speaks and consults globally on creativity, innovation, and the power of play. Pat has also co-founded a national newspaper, The Sunday Herald, as well as various civic and political platforms, Commonweal, Yes Scotland, and recently The Alternative UK. From 2012 to 20, 2020, Pat was the lead curator of Future Fest for the Innovation Foundation, Nesta, in 2020 to 21, he co-designed the R&D process for Unbox 2022, and he is still recording and performing with his brother Greg and Hugh and Cry. A warm welcome to Pat and Indra, uh, and a welcome to Chris from the Summit team as well for this conversation. Indra, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, hello everyone. And I'm, I'm sure that as we're speaking, we're also speaking to an audience that may be listening to this as a video recording and really happy to know you're there even if i can't see and hear you and that's already the first problem of comms isn't it <laughs> comms and media so I, I wanted to start this whole session with a quick framing uh, so that you can get a sense of who the alternative is what are we really doing here you know what's the point of us if you like um and then i'll uh come back to you the audience and think about what are your burning questions around the media uh and uh communications more generally um and then we're going to go over to pat who's going to share with us um a um sorry classic uh going to share with us a, a, a white paper that was written quite recently around uh, which is a proposal if you like for a new media system um, and then we're going to come back and discuss that again so that's the overall shape of today's session so uh, i'm going to share my screen and uh we're going to can you see this now not yet no okay there we go. Now you can see it, right? Yes. So okay, full, hurrah. There you go, full screen. You're good to go. Okay. So, as I said, this is just to um, quickly introduce you or give you a framing or sort of drop you into where the alternative is operating. So, this very first image really is to orientate us to the present moment uh, and in the public space very conscious of returning in a way to a sort of almost 20th century feel of um, crisis. You know, we've been through uh, other crises recently. We're almost in permanent crisis, but this sense of suddenly being jerked back into um, a war situation where the division, if you like, between you know, between opposing forces has come back to us again very acutely. So, um, of course, this is not new to us. Uh, being in a crisis situation is like a permanent reality, uh, but sitting below just about everything we're doing every day, we're in an environmental crisis. Um, and even, you know, more recently, perhaps another layer recently, the, the uh, COVID crisis, which had a very distinct function, I suppose, of helping us to think of uh, populations around the world as experiencing very similar challenges to us, having to take similar actions to us. 
these kinds of images of people all over the world going into lockdown or wearing face masks was quite a rare moment for us to share globally. But nevertheless, how we're reading about the truth about these things, where does our power lie? Who is on our side? Uh, our media system has never really allowed us to feel that as a human population, that we are pulling together. We're not able to pull together as a human population to really face any of these crises. You know, in the case of the war, it's very much an us against them returning to an almost a Cold War scenario. In the case of the environment, it's very much the growth economy versus people who feel they've woken up to the truth of this. In case of COVID, even that, in a way, became something, uh, you know, the mask itself became a divisive point. So the alternative was actually born uh, on, the, on the day that draw, drew attention or the maximum attention, if you like, to the to the nature of a media system that divides us all the time. This was the day that Joe Cox was murdered, which, if you like, was the very apotheosis of, you know, a, a nation divided by a question. You know, should we join Europe or should we leave? Should we stay part of Europe or should we leave? Came down in the end to communities, communities being so divided that somebody took it upon themselves to really, I suppose, express the only agency they felt at the time. And, you know, Joe Cox was the victim of that intense division that we all experienced. So the alternative really was born into the space of, can we even imagine an alternative system that would give rise to people coming together to answer problems? Can we imagine that in this era of multiple crises, people could come together to answer the problems? And it's clear that the current political system, which is built really on a design that, you know, that invites half the country to be invested in the failure of the other half of the country, that we're not going to be able to, within that structure, within that architecture, if you like, we're not going to be able to find each other, come together and meet the crisis. So we've been doing that for five years, designing a new politics and designing a new media to, uh, to, to, to serve that. Um, this was our very first meeting that we had in King's Cross. We publish a daily alternative. Pat will come back to that a little later. Um, but on our fifth birthday, um, we decided to go a step further and in a way take a media um, risk. And we launched a, a completely new idea called Planet A. And the idea of Planet A is to invite people to live and occupy, live into and occupy the future um, by way of uh, acknowledging that what we need for that future is already present. So, if you look at um, the uh, at this present point that we created that describes all of the um, tools and innovations that have been occurring over this last five years that we have been reporting on, uh, we can see that a lot of the infrastructure and a lot of the, um, the knowledge the solutions, if you like, to the problems are already there. And I won't go into these now because I want to keep this fairly brief, but the, the, new, the new tools, the new learning around what it means to be a complex human being and be able to respond to this crisis, a new social politics arising, the new economies arising, new kinds of energy sources. This here refers to the community agency networks that we were describing before. Um, and here the alternative media system that's required to serve all of that. This has really been our focus as the alternative for the past five years. So I hope that's given you some sense of who we are and the scope and the frame within which we're asking the question, uh, what is the new media system that we need 
uh, and what and uh, what would it want to be bringing attention to? Um, and I hope that uh, well, just by pointing at that, it will give you a bit of a sense of how much is already there, uh, ready to respond to our current uh, multiple crises. So on that note, there's, um, we're quite a small group here, so I'm not sure that we'd need to move into breakout rooms. But what I'd like to invite um, all of you to do now who are here um, is to you know, consider for a moment, what do you feel are the main problems of the current media system that we could be addressing over the next hour or so, but also uh, in this bigger project uh, that we are that we are already in the process of, and we're trying to grow and get more attention for, and get more collaboration with. Um, so, ideally, you know, I'd like to hear anybody uh, speak up on this. Please put your hands. Uh, please raise your hand. Um, or, or if you prefer to put something into the into the chat box, but ideally, I think we're a small enough group just to have a bit of a conversation. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good, Indra. And what I'll do is I'm going to put a Jamboard link in the chat and I'll just capture stuff just so we can start to see this picture, picture growing. But yeah, it'd be great to hear just stay mm. in the space and hear from folks. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, I remember reading, um, I really got into this guy called Nicholas Luhmann, who's like a systems sort of social theorist a couple of years ago. And he wrote a whole article about news and it was super interesting mm. about how, and he was basically talking about news, like news as a social system and like how it creates a reality and how like it's, and how like what is defined as news you know, it's like this constant turnover of stuff and tends to be like, you know, I think what we see now is everything's like about, it's so sensationalist and, and it's so about triggering like emotional response. And, you know, it, I think, and that's like sort of quite addictive as we, as we're seeing, you know, in terms of like how social media functions and algorithms and stuff like that. And I think it's like, how do you know, how do we get, how do we, how do you create an alternative to that sort of dynamic, you know, where you're, where the con, sort of content is, you know, like, so one of the, one of the good things that I, that um, I share now and again is the future crunch. I don't know if everyone's seen that. It's just like a roundup of great news stories that you wouldn't have heard of. And I put that, I paste that into Facebook um whenever I get one and I share it with, with people at work and stuff and you, you know it's like and it it is like you look at it and you feel better <laughs> like you read it and you go oh okay it's not that bad <laughs> <laughs> and I think I think that that's it, it's that it is literally that like because because your your reality is very much created through that mediated landscape now isn't it through the news landscape through what you're seeing what you're told I remember like a very there's a very funny sketch by Bill Hicks from years ago where he's going like talking about the 80s and he's going, I want to turn on CNN, I watch it 24 hours a day, and it's like death, AIDS, war, death, AIDS, war. And he said, and I look, I look out the window and there's like you know, like <laughs> a weed and nothing's happening. And it's just like, ah, mm. I think I think there's, there's something around. Mm. around this this dynamic that's been created by the system that we live under which puts us all into this like horrendous hyper vigilant like worried distrustful state i think mm. Mm. and and i don't i don't really don't know what the solution is when you have such dominance of the media system by obviously mm. vested interests but that feels like it's yeah it's almost not the content in some ways it's more like what, how do we create something which is soft and gentle and nice and mm. actually creates a, a, a like a nice, you know, where, where I come away from in, interacting with it, feeling like, OK, not mm. like I've just, you know, watched, I don't know, like 15 episodes of The Matrix really quickly or something, you know, so <laughs> <that feeling like, laughs> you know? Exactly. with the Twitter feed. 
yeah. <laughs> you know, like... yeah no that's great mike thanks that's a really good download actually it's got you raised lots lots of issues um welcome to maria who's also one of our co-initiators at the alternative uk maria we're just um describing um we're just having a quick first look uh, or question about what do we think the main problems are with the media um, or comm system? You know, what, what what is it that we feel is we need to really address? So um, feel free to jump in. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm um, expected to answer that on the spot. <laughs> no, I mean, you could or someone else could. So um, I don't know, Chris, do you have any strong feelings about how the... Yeah. I... yeah. Oh, I can't hear you now. Yeah, I have a lot of a lot of strong feelings about it. And it's very mm. difficult to um, sum it up in a quick and easy answer, because I think the, the kind of issues are deep and complex. And mm. um, I described myself in the chat there as a recovering journalist. Um, ah, OK. And studied the... Uh, journalism about uh, 15 years ago and, and worked as a journalist in Scotland. Um, I did, I did a, a little bit of, had a little bit of experience with the PA and um, the Herald, um, but mostly worked for a community newspaper in the Highlands of Scotland, the Open Times. Mm -hmm. um, but even there you see the issues of like, um, how the, the kind of the scandal and the, the kind of division and the kind of, the great big spat that happened at the council table is the thing that's most exciting um and i suppose then i'm i'm kind of have before that I, i'm from northern ireland so i'm also really interested in this kind of politics of division and, and how that story is told and the the kind mm. of way that the i used to i used to work for a political party in northern ireland a cross community party many many years ago and one of our elected representatives used to say when is the bbc going to join the peace process Mm. Um, because there was the stories that we tell ourselves about what's happening here um, mm. and uh, it makes a lot of people switch off and a lot of people who do see a different way of doing things and do have different concerns they withdraw and they don't get involved in politics or they don't read the media because um, it's also negative um, and then I've worked in in kind of comms and PR for a number of different campaigns and organisations, mm. and now mm. for Transition Together. So I'm thinking about how we um, tell tell a different story and tell it in a way that connects with people and gives them that kind of hope. And like Mike was talking about, that sense of not utter despair, um, but without falling into some of the same traps, maybe. Um, and I, I also look at the, the kind of comms and um, storytelling and communications and social media that a lot of really amazing projects and organizations are doing. And I see they're either, I see a lot of problems with it because I think they are trying to, um, they're either really bad at it <laughs> um, and they're not, they don't they maybe don't have the skills to kind of tell a good story a positive story or to understand where the news media is coming from and how to um get through that those news values lenses and um communicate that your story is worth telling um mm -hmm. and so they're kind of despite their bet and, and then they say oh well you know the media is never interested in what we're doing but part of the time is because you're not really communicating it at all well um or uh, I've also worked for a really big charity and um, their kind of temptation to um, say, well, this is where people are at and these are the stories that sell. And so therefore we will tell our story in a way that we know is going to get headlines, even if mm. it's not really um, the whole story or not as complex or as um, subtle or as uh, dignified as perhaps it should be in terms of mm. the people who are receiving that charity. So. I think there are so many issues and <laughs> I am interested, I guess, in how we create an alternative media system, but also in the meantime, work better. You know, those of us who have a different story to tell, a positive story to tell, how do we work better within the system that's there to actually 
mm. um, try and create more space for alternative voices and alternative stories to be told. Sorry, I've waffled on a long time there. No, no, in a way, I, I'm I'm really thrilled that you are with us today because I think that you'll be, yeah, and both you and Mike have ex already expressed a, a real, uh, a really thoughtful um, range of, you know, ideas that mean you would, you know, I'm looking forward to working with you in this next hour or so to try and work through some of those. Um, you're not thinking about them lightly, either of you, and this is, this is great for us uh, to for this next um, hour or so. Um, I don't know if Mervyn or Rakesh, you are there and, and want to say something that even if your cameras are not on, is there something you'd like to contribute? Shall I go first? I'll just check first so you can hear me because my bandwidth is very difficult. Yeah, we I'm getting you. okay. But I'll leave the video <laughs> off because otherwise it'll go crazy. My Zoom calls have crashed four times in this conference. Mm. Um, yeah, when I came to log into this uh, particular session, I was really pleased that the, the whole topic was being covered because I, I think it's just so important and really deserves a great deal of attention. Uh, attention. My mind was going back to a book that I read quite some time ago by Will Hutton. Uh, a book that was titled The State That We Are In. And basically, he was describing the situation in the UK in terms of how the relatively easy it has been for the conventional media and political agenda to be nudged, or perhaps one should say shoved, onto a conventional pro capitalist, pro consumption, pro growth, don't worry about the future, we'll sort it you know, agenda. You just need to get the right people with the right money running the right media in the right way. You need to get enough people to vote for you to just get over your, uh, get your nose over the line. And then you get the kind of power that Boris Johnson has got with an 80 seat majority, where nearly everything he's doing is wildly unpopular and frankly damn stupid. Uh, the, the, the agenda about refugees probably has been going there. Uh, the way in which suddenly these, these desperate people fleeing war and violence, poverty and despair you know, are treated like they're criminals that could be just dumped on some third country. I mean, it, it's just insane, but Moore was very, very clear in his book about just how relatively easy and how relatively cheap it is to bend the whole system to support that agenda and leave it virtually unchallenged. Um, so, of course, it is important that we have new media, different media. Um, I subscribe to Red Pepper, I look at a lot of alternative um, organisations online to get a different view. <clears throat> a quick tip if I forget it, I also tend to watch quite a lot of Al Jazeera. Mm. Al Jazeera yeah. English gives good international factual coverage of things that matter. And frankly, it doesn't often cover the Westminster Muppets. So it's a really helpful thing to, if you really feel the stuff in UK politics, watch out as a for a break. The other thing I'd like to just quietly mention before I come back, um, new media like Red Pepper are really, really interesting to people like me, people who are already on side, but we do tend to be preaching to the choir. So part of my question about the, the alternative media that we could or might or should build is how to reach the people who will be receptive to our message. But the present moment, either don't care or don't know, or yeah. are not going to be motivated to do anything with it. And likewise, telling people lots of facts or disputing the, the conventional narrative doesn't actually help people to challenge the facts and change the situation. Mm. We can get into a situation where we're changing the narrative and we're doing lots of useful, pretty little things. We're having little parties, we're having little green fairs, we're getting somebody to ride a bike, we're you know, doing the farmer's market or whatever. But you know, <laughs> there's a bit of a tune bird about me. This is, this is not a tune we're playing. This is in crisis. The world is burning. And we've got to mm, really, mm. really, really provoke massive change in the way we live. Well, that's all. I'll pass it back to the group. Yeah. No, that's great. Thanks very much, Mervyn. And Richard, maybe that you'll share the Jamboard at the end and show how we've been capturing some of the thoughts. Thanks very much. Rakesh, welcome. 
Good to see you. Hi there, thanks. So I'm, I'm juggling quite a few things at the moment, uh, so I can't 100% be present, but I have been listening. Thanks, so, um, yeah, so back in the day, I used to do various radio stations, pirate stations in particular, and then mm. uh, started um, internet radio when everyone was still on dial up on, you know, <laughs> 56k modems and stuff like that. And um, so I got involved in a lot of media type stuff, though I'm not a trained journalist or anything. Um, and the way that I see media, actually, another, I was also at the World Social Forum in India, I think something like 2000, I can't remember exactly when it was. And I joined the media um, tent, so 200 um, journalists from around the world. And what, and, and this really highlights the, the point that I want to make is that most of the journalists are, it, it, even regardless of what their heart is, they are governed by the organization that, that pays them, i.e. The, the, the actual news company. And we know that that's owned by just a few handful mm -hmm. of big conglomerates or people. And ultimately the editor is the person who makes a decision as to what they write, whether it will be published or not. So at that particular time, it was not long after Saddam Hussein was captured and every single journalist in that room knew the truth they knew how he was captured and how the kurds captured him and how they handed him over to the americans and then the americans reshot this footage and i remember watching saddam hussein in this bunker looking all pathetic and weak with a, a, a gun in his hand and thinking that is so fake and yet the whole world just shared that lie and i stood up in front of 200 people and you know, art journalists and said why is it that not even one of you told the truth we all know it was the kurds who captured him why is it not one of you stood up and actually told the truth to the world why is it that you are propagating this lie and pretty much everyone said well even if we wanted to write it our editor would just cut it out so even if we wanted to share it through our paper, whether it's the Times or the, the Guardian or wherever, the, the editor would completely rewrite it. And the more that, you, that they would have to keep rewriting articles, the less likely you're going to keep your job. Mm. And so many of them say, we're not going to actually, we just know it's not worth it. If we want to keep our jobs, then we have to basically sing to the tune of, of what our editor is, is, is saying. So given that it's the corporations and big money men who actually own most of the media, mm. the majority of the media we hear is, has a very particular angle. And so it's almost impossible for us to actually really hear the truth. Mm. Since I was a child, you know, growing up and I, I, and I, uh, you know, where I went to school, I basically listened to what the teachers were telling me and realize that that's not my truth. That just mm. is not my truth. And mm. every time I would question them, uh, for questioning them, having the cheek to say, sorry, sir, but you're wrong, you're bullshitting me. Uh, my reward for that would be to physically be beaten, to be continuously up in front of the headmaster who would then cane me, whip me, whatever, you know, cane me, slipper, whatever. So I very, much, very, very quickly realized I need to be smarter than the education system. And I switched off completely from listening to anything. I threw away my television in 1988. I've never had a television set since. Yeah. And, um, and so basically I can think for myself. And what I find is very few people have the ability to think for themselves. They are so influenced. I'm sorry, this may sound a bit harsh, but they're so influenced from such a young age to see a world in a particular way uh, that um, it's really it's very difficult for them to try and understand the world in any other way. Mm. And so a lot of the work that I do as a, I teach permaculture, eco village design and socioxy and various other things is to actually uneducate people, to allow them to actually see and start feeling the truth, because many people know 
deep inside what they're being told is not true mm. but they don't know how to deal with that they don't know how to find the, the truth and this mm. juxtaposition between what their heart is saying and what the system and all the people around them are saying you must do you know mm. to have a good life and da, da, da. Uh, there's such a, a conflict in there that uh, even though as say deep in their hearts they know what they're doing is wrong they still do it anyway mm. and they're still mm. influenced by because they're so influenced by media mm. and so until we break the actual uh, ownership of media and actually have independent media i can't see any way mm. that we really move forward and really start creating beautiful human beings that will really do justice to this mm. amazingly beautiful mm. planet that we have Wow, thanks very much, Rakesh. Um, that's quite a story, and uh, I, I feel as if you're definitely on the same page as us. You know, I'm, I'm a social psychotherapist myself, and I, can, I suppose I can point at how we've been harnessed and manipulated psychologically to be addicted to this current way of seeing things. Um, and that's very much part of what we're trying to bring into the situation. So this notion of truth, my truth, you know the idea that we have we know something that isn't really being told um it's, it's quite a big cause of our collective depression um in our society um maria would you like to jump in we've got another few minutes let's just keep harvesting the thoughts of uh, our crowd yeah i think i i mean second what Rakesh was saying that um, I feel like a story told about us uh, in the mainstream media um, doesn't really ring to with ring true with our hearts, um, and in particular, how the media sort of sustains, maybe even creates this divides between us. Mm. Um, is not actually like true in many cases. Um, so I think that's my sort of main frustration around the media, um, the disconnect between us as humans and the story that's told about us generally. Um, yeah. Can, can I just ask you to, just to share your own thoughts about, you know, from, uh, you know, regen a kind of perspective, you know, what about social media? How does that does what is, what is social media doing for you? Is, are there pros and cons? Or do you feel that that's the same? No, you don't need to be too comprehensive, just your first thoughts, whatever comes to mind. Um, no, I think social media is fascinating and amazing. Um, I'm not saying that it's um, not corrupted or not, you know, broken in some ways, but um, I think we hear completely different stories now than we did, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, especially, I think, you know, I mean, just thinking about some of the young people that I've hung out with during the summit in Zoom rooms um, that they're actually able to like get out their message and share their opinions and people enjoy it. People enjoy their energy, what they have to share. They get involved in things. Um, I mean, when I was 17, the social media wasn't that big of a thing and I never felt like I had anywhere to share my thoughts. So like anyone was really interested in what I thought as a 17 year old person, but I think that's shifted now. Um, and I think it's a brilliant thing for young people <laughs> in that way. I'm not like gonna go into like what it could actually mean for attention span or health or mm. all the destructive things around, you know, some people don't feel empowered or there's an ideal that maybe they have to live up to, but um, yeah, I'm sure there's better social media as well, but 
Mm -hmm. it shifted a lot of things mm. no that's really helpful thank you and Maya, i'm not sure if you're able to contribute or take part or if we could see you um, but what we're discussing welcome anyway to our session and what we're discussing is simply sorry richard i see your hand uh, <laughs> uh, we're simply discussing first you know, first level sort of what do we feel are the problems with our current media and how are we experiencing that media and uh, yeah, any first thoughts about that? So over to you. And then Richard, I'll come back to you. Okay, maybe you're not able to speak. I thought I saw a hand there, but <laughs> okay. I'm gonna let Richard come in, Richard. Thank you. And Maya, just, uh, yeah, pop yourself off mute if you want to come in and, yeah, take the space for sure. Um, just offering thoughts, really, or observations. It's interesting to me, uh, coming off the back of what Maria was saying about this curiosity, this fascination with social media or these different, if we start expanding what we understand about what media is, I guess. And I'm, I'm you know, I have two things come to mind. One is like when texting, who remembers when texting was a thing, was the main thing? <laughs> Remember texting? Like, what? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, texting. So didn't texting cause the downfall of a government in the Philippines? Wasn't that one of these stories of media, of the way things mobilize, the way change happens? Um, and I wonder, you know, Maria was talking about the, the young people who've been contributing, owning, facilitating, leading sections of this summit uh, and how social media has been a real tool for them. Uh, uh, and then, um, then the other thing that came up for me was um, my eldest son's 13. He has a mobile phone, he's had one for a year and a half and how TikTok consumes him. Really? Yes, parent, parenting worry on one level. Mm. But on another level, you're like, and I guess all of these things together, uh, uh, for me, um, I kind of notice a trend of something new happening, like texting or social media when it's in its infancy, even Facebook in the beginning, I bet, has a freshness and an ownership, a more democratic ownership as such in terms of content, perhaps, um, until the power structures come back in, these old power structures that were chipping away at that we're wanting to kind of hold new Paris power structures I would argue like this generation the last 30 years perhaps since the 80s you know it's mm. actually not very old when we talk about the old or current system mm. for me but it's very the power is definitely there so this was a session last year hey where does the power lie this is a big question within what we're talking about I think so the power comes in and then Facebook becomes what it is today or mm. texting. OK, so the the management of the technology, if you like, um, in order to quell the masses, in order to quell pop the popular democratic nature of these tools. So I guess as a 48 year old, I'm kind of reminded to go, ah, maybe the exciting bit is the new the, the new media, the new ways mm. people are defining what media is for them. Uh, and I'm then mindful of what Rakesh was saying about how people unlearn, how people own their own being, their own spirit, their own mind, um, and how my 13-year-old son navigates all of this stuff, you know, when TikTok is completely sucking him in. Mm -hmm. There's kind of so many little mechanisms and ingredients and previous mm -hmm. patterns. I guess that's what I'm noticed. That's what I'm hearing and noticing. Mm. Um, and noticing opportunity, but David and Goliath type vibes, you know, uh, big time. And how do we address that power balance? Yeah, that's my, mm. that's me. Mm, thanks very much. And um, yeah, I, I, thank you, Maria, too. Because once we bring into the space the question of social media as well, um, and I, I, you know, before that, Rakesh, you, you brought in the idea of the radio, you know, radio and the pirate radio. My God, that was an era as well. You know, then we begin to see really much how big this question is, right? It's not just a question of the headlines and the newspapers 
a lot, a lot of us are still thinking about the newspapers that we used to be able to buy and we might be reading them online now but it's just that's just the headlines if you like in 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 a broadcast form of media but media now is a very different animal we're able to contribute to it we're able to be it ourselves and we're thinking about um the broader message uh what the the many you know forms that it can take and who is really able to control that so it's a multi-layered question of where does the power lie as you rightly say and um you know where is our agency in all of this which are the, the you know the eternal questions so um, i'm gonna about to hand over to pat now to really show us uh, or share with us um what's what is really um a, a it was written as a white paper and pat may, maybe you can explain what that is um but the first leg if you like of what will eventually become a proposal for uh, a new, new media system that we will be trying to get funded. We want to find collaborators and so on early days. Um, but Richard, do you just as a, as a final, just final piece of this, break, this breakout, which wasn't quite a breakout, do you want to just quickly show us the jam board? Just yeah, share the sure screen. Thing. Sure thing. Um, and then screen. Pat, that would set you up um, ideally for the, yeah. Okay, so this is not comprehensive at all. Uh, I'll put the link back in the chat. You're welcome to keep layering it in because what's for sure is conversations in this summit are food for our practice going forward. So this may well be um, useful for you. But we were riffing on this question beginning of what, uh, what are the problems with the current media system and our conversation took us to perhaps the boundaries and what goes beyond that. But definitely a whole load of stuff there's the yellow post-its here mm. around the power of the current standard media, if you like, six crooks own the news. This was an XR poster around my way. I'm not sure how mm. that was Wandsworth in South London or beyond. Um, the idea of a SPAX conflict division um, and certainly the choice of framing towards propaganda. You know, this idea of how the media controls the message. You see an image and then you believe it and it becomes fact. Was it under, uh, I can't remember which press secretary it was who talked about alternative facts, you know, this kind of danger zone of propaganda. So a whole load of stuff around here, stupefaction of people through media, perhaps. And then this question, how do we work better with the current system? This is a theme of the summit, working with the current system while the new emerges this is our reality. This is where we are in 2022. What does that look like? And a whole load of stuff in the blue post-its here, relationship between media and changing the narrative. How do we tell a different story really well? Uh, elements like this. Um, a couple of outliers on the green ones there, couldn't quite categorize. Um, uh, and then there's a few tips there. I couldn't resist writing pirate radio. Um, so <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a little flyby, perhaps useful nuggets or flavors or stuff to enrich our conversation going forward. Lovely. Thanks very much, Richard. And over to Patrick. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes? No? Okay, great. Thumbs up. Uh, the usual panicky moment trying to get one's uh, presentation to share. Can you see that? Can everybody see that? Fantastic. I'm just going to, oops, no, I've already done that. Hold on. Stop. Done. <laughs> and there we are in full Technicolor. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Just to kind of explain what this is, this is um, a sort of slide version of, as Indra said, a white paper that we have been uh, tinkering with in Google Docs with uh, a peer group of friends and colleagues over the last 12 months. Um, uh, and it, uh, the white paper is, 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 has become a kind of a convention amongst tech communities where if they want to basically explain uh, the high level uh, theory behind what their offer. I mean, sometimes it's mathematics, sometimes it's a manifesto. So this is a sort of, uh, the slides towards a, a white paper on uh, defining what an alternative media system would be. And it's also self-consciously about not just alternative media, but an alternative media system. So the idea that this is actually a systemic challenge and that we're facing a system uh, and we might need to devise a counter system that has um, equivalent interlocking parts that could 
deliver a different experience or have a different function. So that's that's just to, to keep that in mind. That's that's what to, it's not so much a media a critique of existing media and a proposal for new publications. It's looking at how the whole thing hangs together and trying to be as sort of ambitious from our end of things about how we might uh, build that uh, and where where the places that we might start and the resources and structures that we might want to uh, uh, adapt or invent a new. Okay. So um, our media system is broken, shall we? Let's see if we can demonstrate this. Uh, just to put this in context, this was this is this is a little montage between uh, the BBC, the mainstream BBC report on what came to be known in Glasgow as the Kenmuir Street protest, where um, a, a bunch of uh, immigration police came to try to take two citizens away and the entire community came out and stopped it from happening. I mean, it's, this is a kind of regular occurrence now, but this is a kind of notable point where it happened. But um, there's, uh, so the BBC has uh, takes the beginning and the second clip is from someone with a smartphone hanging out a window watching the same. An immigration enforcement van containing two men was surrounded today by protesters attempting to prevent it from leaving a street in Glasgow. Some of the protesters were heard shouting, let our neighbours go. Police Scotland said a number of its officers had been called to the south side of the city to support the UK border agency. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon described the situation as deeply concerning. Tonight, the two men have been released. <laughs> The point is obviously made. Right? Uh, that was the BBC's angle on it, and that was um, a citizen journalist, I guess we would call them, uh, angle on it. Um, the media system is broken. If that's the if that's the disjunct between the way that broadcast news reflects something and the way that a, a single person with a camera hanging out of the window can represent it, the reality is not being well, even as it is reality, has not been well represented through mainstream media. So, okay, so um, let's restate the problem again. Um, there's the classic meme, you've probably seen it on social media a lot where people just sort of take copies of the front page of the Daily Mail and the Daily Express and show how relentlessly they hammer away week after week on the, the hot um, regressive theme. And this is obviously one on asylum, anti-asylum seekers, anti-migrants. Um, yet, nevertheless, uh, just 28 people, just, just 28 people uh, in the UK say they trust most of the news most of the time, according to a poll in January this year, which is actually down from 40% in January 2009. So there's a there's a kind of so as as the media attempts to kind of manipulate uh, people's opinions, there's also an awareness that they are not to be trusted so they play on collective fears it's almost as if they're involved and uh, not so much in, in cognition but affect they're not so much involved in rationality but I emotion um is that it, it's complicated i think maybe people dimly sort of realize that as well um another part of the problem is really about in reference to what was being said before about local media um it's quite extraordinary that uh, this a statistic that i discovered 67 0.2% of local authority districts lack a daily newspaper, uh, as in an everyday local newspaper. That's sort of an extraordinary uh, democratic uh, civic uh, deficit. So what that means is that, you know, not, not only don't most communities see uh, their own world um, uh, uh, reflected in their media, because the media doesn't exist, because it's not structurally there, uh, they also miss out on their locality being connected to global trends as well. So it's like a double deficit. So they're actually denuded of structural awareness of their immediate community and they're denuded of the relationship between that and 
the, 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 the trends, the massive mega trends that we know are affecting everybody, whether it's from climate or technology or, or migration or inequality um, at the level of their everyday lives. But on, so on both levels, at the local level, people are uh, very poorly served. The alternative media isn't really covering the gap. This was a bit of analysis that I found from uh, the Media Reform Coalition, which is a really interesting <coughs> organization that to try, tries to keep um, information on radio, media reform alive. Um, total monthly UK visits to what they call digital, national or partisan media, which is things like, including right and left, but mostly left. So Guido folks at the top there, but uh, other, other items like Novara Media and Open Democracy. That's 7.259262 of total monthly UK visits. That's 6.4% of the below, which is the total monthly UK visits to these kinds of online services, um, is to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, TikTok is 114,000, 120,000 visits. So that's that's a very small, small percentage uh, of their total interactions with you know, engaging, some would call addictive media, by the non-legacy indie alternative media. It's very, very small percentage of the kind of um, content that is entrancing, say, you know, Richard's uh, teenage, uh, teenage child. Um, so, uh, we need not just massive reform. Reform would be nice, uh, although the reform, of course, when we think about Channel 4 privatisation, is all going in the wrong direction, but invention and construction would be even more, even better. Uh, but it's, so the question is, um, the, the classic question you would ask uh, if you were doing an analysis, this is, well, who needs and wants an alternative media system? What is the, is there any evidence that we can gather that it's, there's, a, there's a need and a want for it? Um, so here's, here's some stuff that I've managed to kind of find from various um, marketing and business reports. Um, one, of the, one of the outcomes of COVID, obviously one of the outcomes of many years of transition town advocacy, um, is that COVID has solidified uh, ethical and sustainable consumption values in British life for significant minorities of the population. And this is from the Deloitte report. Um, and everybody points to what they call the value action gap. You know, in the UK, 92% of people say they want to live a sustainable life, but only 16% are you know, actively changing their behaviours. So there's a lot of discussion in sort of enlightened marketing about how, how to sort of close the value action gap. And there are some statistics that show that there, are, there, be, there could be sort of practical ways to do that by focusing, giving, putting things on certain priorities. Um, it, what you will notice from these slides that I'm about to show you is that right at the top, it's interesting there that you know, would you prepare, to, would you be prepared to pay more for goods and services that for an ethical uh, product? And the top thing there is the practice and respects of civil rights. Just underneath it is waste reduction, and just underneath that is producing sustainable packaging. So that's that's repeated uh, in terms of ev environmental practices you value. Right at the top there, you can see waste reduction, forty-four percent. Uh, circular sustainable packaging, 43%, very, very practical and kind of hands-on. Which of the following do you think would have helped you to adopt a more sustainable lifestyle? Schemes to remove plastics and packaging, clarity on recycling. In the last 12 months, what have you personally done to have a sustainable lifestyle? 61% limited my use of single-use plastic, bought more locally produced goods. But it's it's interesting, it's interesting that the people are right um, are right at the level of uh, the, 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 the visceral stuff or the physical stuff in their life. What's the thing I can physically, practically, materially do to respond to this in terms of my everyday groove? Now, um, what's the challenge for, for media, for, um, for transition towns and similar organisations like ourselves, the alternative? Um, is you would, you would want, if you can get the chance to get at people in a visceral way, rather than in a facts-led way. I think someone was making that point that you know, facts won't get to people, but maybe an, an emotional engagement will help you to engage with, with alternative, um, different analyses, different factual analyses of a situation. This is a great example, which I'm not going to show you because you won't be able to hear it, but this is basically uh, Boris Johnson talking uh, greenwash in front of um, uh, 
uh, in front of number 10. And uh, he's being, he eventually gets snowed under by all the plastic that is dumped by the UK on other countries that we generate uh, in a day. I mean, I'll just show you a little bit of it so you can see the kind of kinetic fun of it. Greater duty for any nation than protecting our people and our planet. The UK government is a global leader in tackling plastic pollution, and we can be incredibly proud of what we are doing. Yeah, but that's so that's what or that's what uh, that's the kind of media strategy that um, people in the sort of, you know progressive green movements might might want um, uh, uh, creative uh, advertisers who want to donate their time to these causes. That's the kind of that's the kind of visceral impact that they might they they might want to make. Um, so uh, it's 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 a practical life of consumed stuff is where people are most susceptible to starting the great transition. Two questions here. Um, for you to sort of wave a fist at the government doesn't have much, much agency. Um, uh, so how can you act now? Um, and the eco science tells us that the northern nations needs to be post stuff by 2030. And the, you'll, you'll know these graphs, I'm sure you'll all know them. But um, I, I think the, the main thing that it challenges is that people need to move away from a consumerist lifestyle with incredible rapidity. They need to get down that IPC 1.5 degree slope um, with, with uh, speed uh, and, and in a way that almost feels like a, it's, it's a sort of revolution that's required rather than just some sort of, sort of light reform. Uh, the, the, the challenges to that, to uh, urging people to kind of radically shift their lives and, and within, within a climate window, uh, to prevent tipping points is, is, is an extremely high challenge. So uh, the good news is, is that it can be done. The hard news is, how do we get there? And this is from a guy called Jason Hickel, who's a writer I, I rely on a lot for analysis of these questions. But when you look at that list, um, binding targets for material reduction, scale down problem industries, private cars to public transformation, limit advertising, bland, ban planned obsolescence, shorten the working week, re replace GDP. Um, it's at the very least, that's an extraordinary agenda. And it really needs a different kind of thought world to make that possible. And I, I don't know, we're wondering whether anything less than an alternative media system is going to help people to be able to take these kinds of actions in time. So uh, uh, how can we imagine an alternative media system working from the, the, the assumptions that are laid out there by, by Hickel, the targets, the lifestyle and structural targets that are laid out? Uh, how do we get an alternative media system that can help us get, help people get there? And what elements would we need it to have to make it both viable and attractive? Um, Indra, shout on me and tell me if I'm running out of time or if I'm taking up too much time. Uh, so, hold on, I'll have a look, see if you've said that to me in the chat. No, you're fine so far. Uh, that is, uh, yes, that Jason Hickel said in, in the chat. Okay. Um, what are the kind of things that we can do that would improve, that would, you know, in the meantime, improve the media? Um, uh, solutions based or constructive journalism is one way to answer the question that was raised about how do we actually deal with media as it exists. There's a very, very strong case for solutions based or constructive journalism, even a strong business case uh, for publications that want to have an active relationship with the readers because an active relationship is usually a more commercially viable relationship. Um, and this is if, you, if I will, I'm happy to distribute any of this information. But there's a there's a lot of research on how um, uh, solutions based or constructive journalism operating in a kind of feature level uh, renders situations um, as uh, as people who are in them being having agency rather than being victims of their circumstances, having ingenuity and adaptability about how they respond to their circumstances rather than being crushed and obliterated by them. Uh, and it's a way, it's a, an actual practice of journalism 
taught in, taught in schools, proselytized by certain organizations, that gets away from news as catastrophe, as polarization, as problem center. So I think there's actually a way in which we can sort of foment that kind of judgment. That's what we've been trying to do with the Daily Alternative over the last five years is solutions based or constructive journalism. There's a lot of discussion about how you might make that happen. Um, uh, so what are the interesting opportunities for telling positive stories, community, local strengthening and empowerment? Um, a story which lands from the outside onto a community might be a moment of joy then gone in the media flow. A story which arises from and enables a community's self-determination is sustainable joy and a resource for action. So the kind of stories that are maybe generated at the local level it, it, it really depends on the system that's generating them. You know, if, if there's a real loop between reportage and action um, and, and a sense of a, a horizon for the community having been defined and, and, and gotten to, this is what we think is possible with the, the CANS process that we do in the alternative. You know, then what is what? How does that fundamentally qualitatively change your relationship to media itself? If if it's a constant script for action and inspiration, what what kind of media does that? Is that an is that a media that's as actually quite unprecedented? We haven't seen it before. Maybe that's something we can make. So you, this is a, a investigation that we did into Stoke. Um, as, as opposed to the usual local council stories about Stoke, there is a lot of crafting in Stoke. They do a lot of experiments with community currencies. Um, they do a lot of uh, celebration of the local uh, heritage and tradition. Um, what's the? What, that's an example of a, of a kind of, you could call it an editorial framing that a new media system um, possessed by the community in various ways could, could make possible. Um, uh, so the, there's a question about, you know, how, how do, if you were going to try to create this system, then how would you make it, uh, how would you have it stay true to values? Um, and how would you get it, how would you get beyond the usual suspects, the people who are playing to the safe audience, as was mentioned before, beyond the progressive activist based? Uh, th this, this is our sort of realistic assessment of how that happens. Don't underestimate the power of the usual suspects to be able to amass resources a mass willpower be quite determined to, to start something being uh, being buildable. Um, and then for those people then to have a kind of two dimensions beyond that, which is for them, for the user suspects to think about the people who aren't part of our discussion, who do share our values, who we haven't got to yet. And then that yellow cloud looking at people who don't share our values and then figuring out how to um, use the strengthening that the user suspects and the excluded but share our values have felt to get to other people and um yeah i think that's, that's us by the way that's us yeah that's that's we, uh, we are yeah. the usual suspects right yeah <laughs> <That's us. laughs> who, who's, who's who are, who are talking here mm. um but it, it, it's these are these are graphics that are trying to sort of show how if you think about what it might take for you to build a media system either even locally or uh, at a kind of regional level or in a kind of a cluster um, it's it's striking how many voices could be part of that system and could feed into that system there. Um, to, this is an exercise that we did in terms of our own media system, the people that are circulating around us and that we're engaging with. And it, it was quite a rich picture. And so the question would be, what would be the media system that would ask them to feed into that system? And how would that system process that input, take it back to them? And then what would be the relationship between that process and uh, action, concrete action in the community. How how would how would that link uh, be um, forged uh, between the relationship between the stakeholders, the media uh, system managers, or uh, at least facilitators, and then how that relates to action? I think it's something we'll want to try and keep trying to figure out. Andrew, do you want to speak to this slide? That's probably the one. Yeah. So, so this is really where we've got to so far. Um, and we really would like to invite your comments on this, but um, because sometimes when we talk about this huge um, challenge, we might we might be tempted to think, oh, we could dream something up, right? But it's never going to work. I think that's a little bit about. I think we all mentioned a little bit of that idea that, you know, we might 
have our own, you know, media, like the alternative has been an alternative media for the past five years, but who's paying attention anyway? That's the big question. So this, this diagram is attempting to show at least where the architecture, the rudimentary architecture already exists and how it could come into relationship with itself to build something that we, you know, we do have the tools to amplify. So let me just describe what this is. Right at the heart of this um, diagram is the question that we began the alternative with, which is, you know, what's the human being at the heart of this system? And one of the one of the big shifts that we've all you know, described is that, you know, in the old system, we are just taking part as homo economicus, you know, we're just seen as people who need to be told what to do. The only reward that we're really offered is, you know, is a roof over our heads or money, material things, and even that we have to really fight for. But that's who we are. Whereas what all of our work has done is to reveal that we are much more than that. We're very complex biopsychosocial, spiritual entities. And I think all of the movements even represented in this small group here would attest to that, that a human being is a complex thing and its needs are complex. So this is the thing that's really at the heart of anything new that we do. Now this layer here around this, these are the community agency networks that we have perceived over this last five years are beginning to answer the question in small ways through networks, starting with a local community. So you'll see here the Transition Towns Network is typical of that kind of um, response in this era to the multiple problems. You know, transition towns are not simply community organizing. Transition towns bring the whole system into being within a local community in a way that honors the, you know, the complex human being, draws upon the community as the kind of incubator of the health of that human being and multiple human beings, but in a way that also has a real impact upon the planet, a more healthy impact upon the planet. So, so that idea of a community agency network as being the core element, if you like, or the core unit of a new system arising uh, is something that, that, that you know, we're trying to land. And I think Transition Towns has also been landing. It's a global network and we would call it a cosmolocal, meaning it brings all the global information into the local. So there's no separation really between the local and the global. But what's interesting maybe for transition towns themselves is that, um, and, and I would say that many, many transitioners already know this, but you know, maybe as a phenomenon to consider that um, if you are a can, if you are a network of cans, there are also others. There are many other networks of cans that are doing similar work in terms of bringing the human being into contact with the planet through community and everything that that entails, including what's the new economy of this? You know, what's the new language of this? What's the new way of being of this? All the questions that transition brings is also being brought in, uh, you know, the, the question around the donor economics or the donor economic labs or eco-villages, or many municipalities, or the DAOs, you know, the, the new forms of distributed uh, autonomous organizational structures. Uh, this idea that is brought in India, for example, with neighborocracy, or, um, you know, throughout the world, actually, mutual aid networks have sprung up. So our generic term for all of this is community agency networks. Um, of which there are many, and there are, you know, global networks of these things. Our question in this layer here is really a comms question, right? How are these different networks able to talk to each other? What is the communications between them? Are they sharing tools, stories, methods, practice? This is the first layer in a way 
that has to be healed or generated. We need architecture for this layer here. And this, um, what we would call, uh, yeah, th this, this, this being, I think, Mike, you're very, you know, active in this era, learning how different kinds of cans can really not, re you know, not duplicate all of their efforts, but start to really pull their efforts and give, give rise to um, a commons, you know, a global commons of tools and practices. This is a com, this is really a comms challenge before it is a media challenge. And then these out around here, you might recognize these as well. These are different organizations that have actually already arisen as comms groups to try and distribute this knowledge between all of these different people. So, you know, um, the well-being organizations, we all, this is a massive global, you know, comms system that is trying to share the news. It wants to be, in a sense, the new news, but it's not the only one. There's also this fantastic group called A Thousand Landscapes, who are looking at it all more from an ecological viewpoint and connecting places all over the world that are actively building uh, tools and solutions, as Pat was describing. This is the peer-to-peer -peer network. These are technological organizations that are trying to do the same job. Permaculture, we know, was really the er one of the early comms systems that was trying to teach and share and workshop solutions. Um, this is trust the people that arose out of um, Extinction Rebellion. Uh, you know, quite a small group still, but working in the similar way, similar patterns to these other information networks, trying to teach, trying to disseminate the knowledge, trying to, um, you know, give rise to action. Fearless cities, these are cities that are involved in these kinds of actions, disseminating the knowledge, trying to teach, trying to, uh, you know, bring what Pat was describing as the move from solutions to action. This eco-civilization here, I don't know how many of you know about eco-civ, um, which again is another global organization started in America, but a lot of its attention is on the eco-civilization that China is trying to give rise to. So attention to China in an American way, it's a very interesting network that's trying to bridge divides, bridge global divides. Um, we all know about the bioregions as a new, um, you know, almost like an alternative to a national structure is the bioregional structure. Again, trying to teach people how to think in new ways. And shareable here is an, was an American initiative in the first place. But this is very much focused on what it feels like to share your resources. What is the good feel of the, all of this coming together? So. If you can see now that these are three, these are circles within circles of people who are doing incredible work, um, teaching, connecting, imagining, storytelling, but they're not even, we're not even connected to each other yet. You know, we're all almost competing with each other for resources, for money, for attention. So the very first part of this new media system is really bringing these circles into connection with each other, which is not a small task. Um, technologically, it's not a small task, but even emotionally and existentially, it's not a small task because each one of these really was born because it thought it was doing the work that no one else was doing and therefore appears in the system as the solution to our problems. Now, when we have many that feel in that way, we are the solution to the problems, then there's also the internal work of letting go of that status, really being willing to work with others, giving something up. But it doesn't necessarily need to go the full collaborative road. Our sense is that there's a way that all of everybody can cooperate. It doesn't always have to go as far as uh, collaborate. You don't necessarily have to break yourself down structurally to be able to be in relationship with these others. But this comm system is very much the first stage of a new media system, because this is the comm system ultimately that should feed 
a new media system. So if the current media system is really just running off the news from the 2%, what we call the 2% that are really uh, giving all of the power to Westminster, which in its turn is giving all the power to the growth economy. This is a reorientating of what is the power source of a new media system. So this is the new power source that we're trying to bring into uh, internal relationship, really grow a real, you know, quite independent, if you like, somewhat autonomous, somewhat anarchic, you know, alternative source of news, which then has the task of becoming a media system that will be attractive to people who are not the usual suspects. So if this, all of this is really about the people who already care, are already working, uh, who share values to some extent, this bigger part here is how we make that attractive to people who don't think about it, who don't care about it, who may even be in principle against it. And this is where the social media becomes so very um, core to the task of attraction to solutions. So in a sense, this is the bigger thing here. This is much bigger than this. <laughs> if you can see my um, arrow. Um, but that is, these are the basics. This is now the basic architecture as we see it of a new media system that is possible. So I think that's kind of it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I think Pat, thanks very much. You set up the problem. You gave us the broad idea of what really needs to happen. And then this final slide was, you know, what is already slowly coming into being. Um, and now we'd like to go back to our audience. Okay. okay, hold on. Yeah. Yeah, and just the final, the final thing to say. Um, there's a there's a whole set of software and socio technical suggestions about how this would be technologically addressed, which is which we can geek out at, at any at any point in the future. And some of it is quite as you. I, I'd like it to be examined and challenged. Um, because it's not as if there aren't alternative, isn't alternative software to that which comes out of Palo Alto and Cupertino, but the um, resourcing and and constructing and expertise question is enormous, and um, some kind of combination, or yeah, some kind of combination of subscription, alternative currency, philanthropy. Um, enlightened municipalities, enlightened states, any mixture of all uh, needs to start putting some resources uh, towards um, social media platforms whose power, as Indra has just described, comes from a completely different place from the usual uh, American capitalist location, which is which is which inevitably will shape the way that we interact and the content that comes through. The media it's impossible that, that it wouldn't and then just briefly to say that uh very briefly and then i'll go actually because i have to get i have to do something else it, part of our original presentation was was driven by anxiety about the rise of these two new television populist channels delighted to say that they're failing miserably um and so well it's describe just, them pat just oh, the, the, so this would be this would be um GB News and uh, Talk TV. GB News is, has its own set of plutocrats behind it. Talk TV is but it's backed by Murdoch, um, with the flagship show being Piers Morgan. And we were we were thinking this is terrible. This is the Fox Newsification of the British media landscape. Looks like there's not much appetite for that level of polarity. So it, it at least indicates that with all the money and malevolence. A malevolent intent uh, it doesn't guarantee success which at least leaves the possibility open that something different with a different impetus behind it and different communities behind it might be might even address a gap that people have or a need that people have for a completely different structurally different kind of media so slight note of optimism there thank you and, I, and i'm happy to respond to anybody in terms of the other elements of this presentation at any point in the future so thank you 
I'm, I'm going to go. You, I've got to go. Yeah. But just, just any initial questions. If you could just save the initial questions. Sure, 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 sure. We can break. We can break into the wider sure. discussion. Yeah. Please, happy to hear any questions. I was stunned into silence. Okay. Yes, Mike. I suppose the the question of how, because there's such a density of media now that you have access to you know and there's this whole whole discussion around like the attention economy now you know it's like hey it's how you get a person's attention is it's not so much yeah i mean that is the key thing in a way is like how how do you how are we yeah you know, how do you get people for who are looking at like the daily mail is still is i think is isn't it the most visited website in the world you know so they so they have whatever they they're doing it's getting the attention it gets attention and it's that thing of how how do we break that you know how do you get people looking at different things you know when i when I, I think of like when i go into a news agent you know you see the morning star which is possibly the only like you know that there's problems with that but you know but it's like that's really that and possibly the mirror and the independent and the guardian the more liberal you know and then they're, they're talking a, about certain things but not the stuff we want to talk about necessarily so it's like yes yeah, like hey do hey does it how do we get that new attention is is it do we need a completely new system or do we need to sort of look at how we in, you know, intervene in the existing methods of uh Getting, getting media out there, i.e. newspapers or social media websites, etc. I'd like to answer that quite quickly. I think this is a really interesting research question mm. because on, on one side, uh, there's quite a lot of work being done about the relationship between what they call affect and cognition. So feels over reels. You know, you, the, the, the way that people select facts is because they have made a prior emotional mm. or affective commitment to something and then and once they make that commitment then they seek facts that answer that commitment um now does one want to play that game interesting that's why i put the uh, the, the, the green piece clip in because that's a fantastic attempt to get at people viscerally and then to make the to make the factual point about how much plastic you know the uk is dumping now another way there's another way to look at this which is to say that we we need to recalibrate a relationship to knowledge and emotion and media and do it in a calmer way. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about this and social about social technology, people like Tristan Harris, you've seen the social dilemma, etc. But one of the consequences of that is that there, there's a lot of um, distressed software designers trying to figure out how to create interfaces that just strike different tones with people and enable them and empower them in an entirely different way. Um, which is which would be to take the to reg, um, not not go for the trigger points emotionally, and and try to kind of just create a different qualitative relationship between you, the the your the, the news you require, the knowledge you require, and the world you want to change. I think there's a bit of a we need to study that a bit, um, and I think there may be a tactical question. You may you might go the affect route the. the to get people's attention for something, but then when you get them, you you pull them into a different way of interacting with media, which which is being devised by various people at the moment. So I, I, that's a that's a that's a, a it's, it's an experimental question. We need to prototype and prototype and prototype again to see what how we get the right mix and balance. Because you don't want to be just a trigger media person, you know, but you don't but you also don't want to be over over deliberative or or believe that deliberation is itself attractive you need to find ways to make these things attractive so that's the that's the that's a very but i think it's a productive polarity i don't think they cancel each other out i think we have to think of different blends and mixes and try to sort of design them and test them out sorry that's the point i feel like if i may interject uh, rakesh has made a sort of sister question in the chat 
the second half of it's like my cast the first half of what you wrote Rakesh and then the second half is what makes it attractive to the people who have a story to share so the idea of gen the content generation Rakesh if that represents your question but by all means unmute and unmute and flesh out if you want to yeah I mean that that's pretty much it so as well as I mean in, in recreating a new structural model for media um you know your your comment was around how do we make that attractive for the people who are going to consume it who are going to be the public but uh, what makes it actually interesting for people who have content how do we make it easy how do we you know low hanging fruits and all that how do we make it because maybe they're already investing putting a lot of time and energy into making their own content somehow mm. and rather than stepping on their toes to say well you know how do we make it really yeah uh, comfortable and easy for people to put content through this new mm, 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 mm. Mm. i mean mm. can i can i answer yeah, just before go i go because i go i don't go um i think it's really easy how it's really interesting how people are responding to that to that uh that question rakesh um the guardian has they do a thing called made in britain and they, it used to be john harris like northern personality running around pointing at things and seeing what people are doing they've now completely shifted it over from input with the joseph rowntree foundation and it's much more about not just um listening to more closely to the actual voices in local communities but opening out the filming process and actually being involved in media literacy and so that when the people what the people see on the screen is something that they know that they have mostly in, intended and it's it's a deliberate that's a deliberate sort of shift um you know and then i think the other uh, yeah that's yeah that's so that's so i think that mm. i think people are thinking about that people are thinking about that mm. yeah and i think it's, it's it's an old story that used to be the story about community media in the 70s and the 80s in fact early channel the earliest element of channel four was was radically committed to putting cameras in people's hands and using expertise to bring forth their voice uh, the conversation.uk is a very interesting website in relationship to academics who are so full of jargon they can't communicate with the wider world. And what they do is they have a, set, a team of journalists at the core who work with the academics to turn what they're saying into usable prose. That's another way to think about it. Is that as, as a, there's an expertise, I think that's what you were saying before, Chris, that there's an expertise about conventional news that could be put at the service of alternative Mm. outlets much better but we need to organize those people into mm. uh, but you're, but you're, structural organizations you know sorry to just sure, speak over just for a second perhaps but, but before you leave i think i think one thing that question is missing or one thing that we're forgetting in terms of shifting from you know what is a new media to what is a new media system mm -hmm. is that you, you know, we're, we're deliberately trying to create an architecture for people who become part of something uh, as the generators of that media, yeah. not simply consumers of the media, yeah. right? So at the moment, if I wanted to tell a good story uh, about what I'm doing, I would just, you know, it's be on my Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and it's just out there floating in the internet, but it doesn't have a... It doesn't it doesn't have a, it's not part of a system that in its design is leading people to shift their ways of working and acting that has an impact on the planet. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? It's not simply because one of the biggest problems that we all will have felt over the last 15, 20 years is there are many, many uprisings. Right. We've had, you know, the, the whole, you know, Occupy movement, which was global, which is people rising up. We had the Arab Spring, people rising up. We've had Extinction Rebellion, people rising up. But people rising up and telling a new story does not necessarily lead to systems change. Why? Because their energy of rising up is not connected directly to solutions that have an impact on the planet. It's floating, disconnected from all of that. And what we're trying to do is reconnect the energy of uprising to actual solutions that people can take part in, 
right? So it's no longer a protest. You know, we're not talking about protest anymore. We're talking about people power having a system that leads to actual new, you know, uh, impact and results. That is what we're trying to uh, connect. And that, that system that I described, that whole ball there of how the person gets connected to their local can, gets connected to a comm system, gets connected to a media system, is an actual architecture that needs building. But it would, it would, it would, it would, in a way, answer that question, Rakesh, that you're asking. You know, because it's not simply that people tell stories. In a new media system, their story would lead people to an action and a place to to belong, and people to do that with, which already has a theory of change, which is having an impact upon the planet. That Just is a system. Right. It's yeah. not a. And then the bit about how does that become attractive is the media that keeps pulling people back towards this system. Right. And that, in a way, I think what Pat, you were describing can be as, you know, as much of a tart, if you like, in the public sphere as necessary to pull people into this relationship with this new system. Yeah. People may arise, may arrive at this place, not knowing what they were here for was just some story on TikTok, right? That nevertheless was leading them into this new, into this new relationship with solutions and um, impact. Does that make and sense? And just, just yeah. to make it really concrete, yeah, we have, we have comments below articles where people mm -hmm. ra rage away at the authority of the original article. What mm -hmm. if we completely rethought the comment space as an action space? What's the What's the software? What's the filtering? What's the input that would make your response to an article not a, a you know a frustrated comment, but a pathway to action? That has to be really designed, and it can be really designed. But I think it would have the pressure of communities around about that media that they were mm. saying, "Let's get stuff done. Let's get stuff done." So it's a, that's a different orientation to you to as a reader. So you're not just reading and thinking and responding. You're there as a citizen. A community agent wanting to make something happen that has to be designed i think it can be designed but it takes a lot of quite a lot of resource but a lot of different conscious intention so that would be that's just to make it concrete at a very simple level you know hmm. anyway okay ah. <laughs> Uh, thank you so so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And, and thanks, yeah. every, thanks everybody else for your great, great, fantastic questions and contributions. Please, uh, please stay to the end. That would be great. Thank you. Bye. Catch you next time. Bye bye. Can I just say I'm really fascinated with that concept and idea, and I'd really love to see if there is something already in place that can do that. Because from a sociocratic perspective, for those mm. who and sociocracy, this is the feedback. Um, so when a system is not working, this is the feedback we need to then say, well, how can we change that? So mm. rather than, but obviously at the moment, as, as pointed out, most people just complain, 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 complain. Mm. This, is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Mm. And I, I was like that also, you know, it took me a while to realize that actually with all the activism work I used to do back in the 80s and 90s, I was mostly setting myself up to say, what I was against. I was against Shell, I was against this uh, British government, I was against, I was against, I was against. But what was I doing right? It's easy to say what, what other people are doing wrong, but what was I doing right? And so to then take that responsibility to actually turn that into action, to actually help improve things, this is magic. This is how our societies really start to change. So. I'd be really fascinated to know if there is some kind of uh, mechanism that can turn these negative content comments into some kind of positive action. Mm. Amazing. Love it. You know, and I would say back to you, Rakesh, that with your, um, cause I, I, I love that we actually in this small group, there's an incredible amount of resource and history and decades of thinking and grappling with this. So that's really what we want to pull on, right? We want to pull on those people who've thought about it for a long time because they're the builders of the new system. You know, but always thinking about, you know, um, in a way, Richard's children, 
you know, what is, where, how is TikTok actually going to pull people into this? Because it can. One, one thing, um, a friend of mine who uh, she works, in fact, um, in the States, she works in prisons um, with sometimes lifers using the power of the arts to uh, help them transform their lives, even, you know, either red getting ready to leave prison or to like be, anyway, her, her you know, she, she operates at so many different levels and has so many different kinds of needs. But she has been saying to me recently that she doesn't read the news anymore, but she is still attached to TikTok because that's where she gets her hope from. And if you are, if you are, you know, because you know, obviously it's up to you how your algorithm starts to, what you pay attention to, you get more and more of it back to you. She says that she gets, um, you know, f small films of people doing, you know, dance routines or, um, just being smart in the face of uh, difficult, a difficult thing, like it always got humor in it, always has energy in it, always has creativity in it. That's her feed now by choice, right? So she's choosing as we can to shape her own media system um, while she's doing the real work of trying to reform prisons. You know, this is where we're at now, right? People want to feel good um you know if we're in a system that has just addicted us to feeling a little bit better like the daily mail for example its model might be described as you know we're going to tell you all the bad news about people and how stupidly they behave all the time because that makes you feel you're just a little bit better than they are and that's the level that people are addicted the idea that they're just a bit better than most people who are stupid that's the that's the story right and that's what they're addicted to but there's no alternative there's no genuine alternative you know for the for the people i know daily mail readers right they just continue to read this newspaper they don't have an alternative but just below the surface they're anxious about the state of the planet they're anxious about the lives their children are going to be leading they're anxious about their own mental health, right? Because in the middle pages of the Daily Mail, it's all about well-being and your own, how you can make your life better. It's you know very um, uh, individualistic in that sense. So, you know, that's that's our task is to is to give a real alternative, but still acknowledging that people are attracted through their emotional needs we're driven that way that's why advertising is successful we're driven by trying to get our emotional needs met all the time and there's no reason really um, uh, that we shouldn't use that attraction to pull people back now towards real solutions but if that initial comm system isn't there if we're not all talking to each other in a more constructive way and actually bringing home some of the solutions that we're, we're dreaming of, then, then really we're doing the same thing. We're addicting people to hope without actual impact. So anyway, so I, th I think that, you know, with the, we've got like 20 minutes to go and I think it would be a good idea. Uh, thanks for your prompt, Richard, to just maybe go around the room now and, you know, please just, share what you've thought about the bigger question or any particular thing that you would like to focus on um, as a way of sort of uh, bringing this to a close. Actually, can I, I just have a really quick yes. question for Rick, yes. because I'm supposed to be doing the next session. <laughs> Manny, who am I supposed to be connecting with? Because she, I know she asked me to, I don't think it's Monica, she asked me to get in, get online at a quarter two, but I can't find the email anymore. That's Maria. Yeah, Maria. So I will, I can send you the link to the next session. Yeah. Okay, I'll chuck you on WhatsApp. Is that okay? Or better for my yeah, way through. On WhatsApp, Rakesh, yeah. Rakesh, okay. sorry. Hi, I've been mailing you this morning just to say all the links are on Vive. <laughs> if, you, if you go look for Zoom links on Vive, you'll find it for every session. Five. Okay. So also for this afternoon as well as for just now. Lovely. So these are the really urgent comms, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, too many emails. The comms within the comms, yeah. Go, go, go. Another um, part of this whole paradigm, you know, we're so bombarded <laughs> with stuff, with information. Yeah. And, you know, an important thing such as this, like connecting to the session I'm doing, mm. messages just get lost because I just get yeah. so many messages from yeah. so many different ways. And, um, and so this is actually really part of the, the question that we're asking here. If we want to create new media streams and new ways in which people interact and connect um, genuinely and find information that is really genuinely helpful in transforming this world, mm. we have to compete against all of this noise, mm. information overload. So mm. I think it's a really hard task. With, with all this you know mm. uh, my suspicion is that actually this information overload is actually part of the actual system to keep us confused mm. to okay. keep us to prevent us from actually yeah. finding the real truth because there's so much information misinformation mm. and how to discern between the two which which streams do you listen to yeah mm. i do occasionally listen to al jazeera i listen i used to listen to russia today mm. Uh, BBC but I would always watch every single one and say why are they telling me this mm. I don't mm. believe what they're saying completely mm. but why are they saying this and mm. what can I derive from it but mm. you get it from many different areas mm. that's difficult how many people how much time do people have to to mm. look at all these different streams so mm. if there was a media that I know I could trust because somehow it's been vetted mm. and you know and the whole to use permaculture ethics you know if it is earth care people care fair share it does meet that kind of ethical criteria before it goes out wonderful amazing mm. all right i really should go so well rakesh it was great to meet you and i really want to invite you to you know come join us and be part of building this thing i think you've got a lot to to bring uh, into it tentatively i my diary is when i say full i mean <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> let's see how sure. it goes and stuff and as and when i can i would love 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 yeah. cool you are, okay. you are you are both in london so you never know there may be a meeting in the real world to happen at some point yeah that's good that's a good that's a good call i mean yeah for now so, yeah. yeah thanks okay thanks. 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 okay thank you bye yes there's something for me about um the question of how so currently when you think of how the daily mail or the sun or whatever reflects back certain sections of society or communities of society to itself. You know, you can argue that, you know, it's hold, a lot of it is holding a mirror up, mm. a, a distorted mirror, but it's a mirror that people look at a lot, you know, and go, and you know, I think it's been in the UK, it's been very obvious when you think of the Brexit, um, situation and, and how that, that was reflected back and created this you know almost this new political class two political classes of leave and remain you know that that was very interesting how, how you know actually then what was effectively was the left and right has, was replaced with leave remain um and mm. cut across many political uh boundaries and and that question of like you know People seeking out, people do seek out media that that reinforces their their views. It's it's because I remember when we had transition free press, then you know the newspaper which was around for a while, which was actually pretty good, mm. um, and that was like pretty positive. You know, it was positive stories, and I actually think it could have probably could have gone somewhere with, if it had a bit more funding behind it at the time. Mm. But there's something around, you know, how if if you you watch something which reflects back to you your experience or your community, then that isn't that isn't done predominantly by the mainstream media. Mm. You know that really doesn't happen, and that there has been a complete like hollowing out of um, local, you know, local newspaper. Mm. you know whereas I, I yeah i know people who work in like for the evening post in bristol you know there's some investigative journalism but the journalism is very you know most of it's like new you know press releases which are sent 
two newspapers, which then they just reprint as stories. Yeah, yeah. You know, so we don't we don't have like at many levels, you don't have any more that like investigative journalism, that journalism which actually does want to represent what's going on at a local level, represent a community back to itself. Mm. And um and I wonder if if like you know are are people would people be more interested in a media that they see themselves in rather than it being celebrity mm. or you know like shock horror stories or sensationalism or you know, mm. I don't know Johnny Depp falling over with his missus or whatever mm. you know like which is go all these big stories that are going on at the moment but then that's all like it's almost fantasy they're all like fantasies like like rich people falling out each other and you know like all this like sort of it's some something around like how how do we create something which is interesting and does do and does ask difficult questions and provocative things of our own communities and mm. of our and of the world that we want to be in mm. but at the same time is then you know then people want to read about it because it's something which is is re grounded in reality is is addressing some of the, the questions that we all may have mm. does, does try to um bridge some of this polarization which is happening mm. um in in an interesting and positive way um and, and how how does that play out in through different media channels um i mean i don't know what the answer is i think but i think that that to me is one of the questions is like you know if you're talking about a new media system and what the function of it is look i used to, i was quite involved in indie media for a long time in bristol and that was a that was a way of the, uh, providing a space for the activist community to talk to itself Mm, and yeah. a lot of news stories that ended up in the Evening Post would have started off by Evening Post mm. looking at indie media. Yeah, yeah. You know, but then it was because it was a hub uh, for for quite a while of of those stories. And then obviously now everyone can self publish, etc. Now blogs and Facebook and everything. That centralization to a degree has has been lost. So mm. it's dispersal, the place of everything being. So too far too what widely dispersed now it's mm -hmm. very difficult to get a grip on uh, what, what what's happening and where do you go you know you have to have like i don't know create your own space all, all the things that you you know i think the trust thing that rakesh rakesh was talking about is a very big thing you know you go go to places where you could don't i mean I, I you know i don't think the guardian is perfect by any stretch and as some people on there i just would not like mm. read their stuff and go no but actually it still does there's still people on there who I would trust mm. to read, you mm. know, and and it's like, yeah, it's like that. How do, how do you create a pathway into media, media that reflects people, reflects them back to themselves, that gives credibility, etc. Is I think I think it's super difficult, but I think that is probably what's needed. Yeah, and and, and ideally to have that corroborated and verified by something that is actually happening on the ground in a place near you. You know, I think that's the that's the that's that's the final thing that you know that hasn't been in the media system until now is that the people were inviting into the new space are experiencing this as a reality where they live right so richard and yeah chris just, well, yeah my brain's whizzing and whirring i've popped some things in the chat react in reaction to what mike was saying um mm. but that's really interesting the point you you just make because it makes me think of like the the um framing or the way what we're talking about is held because Tooting is not like Bristol, it's not mm. like Belfast, it's mm. not like, so I guess my chat, if I was to challenge what you just said indirectly, I would say there isn't homogeneity though. There is stuff that is common. Mm. So if one is to zoom out of the obvious, like what do we mean by seeing where with the reality, where we are in what 
always in what what we read in what we're playing around with is imagining mm. a new media system mm. yeah what do we mean by that commonality because mm. people's challenges personal situations are different as well their aspect of life is different there's a lot mm. of difference within it as well as well you know yeah and uh, one thing i would say that the whole of social media has helped us to think about you know as being ourselves now always present in the public space right is the desire for something to be better you know and the tools that are there to help you make things better this like it's a dominant culture right in the west in our western civilization at least and i think that if you're thinking about you know even your own life how you're improving it if you knew that you making a relationship, for example, with, with another person in your community, always wanting to improve those relationships. If you knew that that was part of a whole system of healing and changing, which has an impact on the world, right? And you start to pay more attention to that and you decide, I'm now going to give attention to this rather than to that. That's the, part, that's the moment in which all of this changes. Right. When you actually make yourself, you know, make your efforts, your desires, your commitments, you know, the core of this whole shift. And I think that we have a social media that's absolutely right for that, because I'm reading about that every day on Facebook. I did this. I did that. How can we do this? You know, even at a very basic level of people trying to talk through problems, you know, in relationships to the bigger questions of how does my community come together and then how does the planet and so on. It's that, you know, connecting your personal to your community to the impact on the planet. Mm -hmm. I think our social media is already in that mode, to be honest. It's just we haven't been able to capture it yet as a dominant narrative, you know, mm -hmm. the self-improvement. Even the Daily Mail is caught up in ideas of, you know, self-improvement as a value. So, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're on it. It's just, we ourselves are not necessarily connecting the dots. Um, Chris, your, your final thoughts, because I know, Richard, you've got to move into your... Well, I'll do a, I'll do a casual version of closing out because we're a small... Okay, right, yeah, okay. Space yeah, I'd love to hear from Chris before we... It's been a very, a very rich meal and I need time to digest, I think. But um, I think, you know, what you're saying about people um, kind of accepting a, a poor media and seeking escapism and um, not questioning what they're being told, I think is really wrapped up in um, how people feel about their own agency and yes. their own yeah. ability to um, shape their own community. And, and, and I think, I think they sort of go for that because they feel like they don't have, they go for the kind of let's read about all the scandals and all the dreadful things in the world and who else is to blame for all the problems mm. because they don't feel like they have power to address those problems and find the solutions themselves. Mm. So I think we're not going to have an alternative media system or a new media until we actually, it, it's really caught up in how communities feel about themselves and people feel about their lives and it will be hard to fix one without the other, I guess. Um, but to end on a positive note, I guess, um, I'm thinking about a little, Facebook group in Belfast that I, it's just a free cycle group and um, mm. it, people started sharing stuff and I joined about a year ago and there were about 9,000 people on that. Now, today, there are 18,000 people on that. How about and that? You, you watch those posts and you can tell these are people from all walks of life and all motivations and all kinds of levels of understanding. Um, and there's like about kind of why they're doing it, you know, different motivations. Some people are doing it because it's about like, let's create interdependent communities where we share things. And other people are like, I've got this stuff I need to get rid of. Um, and other people are doing it like, I really want to, I, they're really coming from a charitable mode. I want to give stuff to people who are less fortunate than myself. myself. Um, mm. You see all, the range of personalities mm. and, and mm. kind of experiences and community on there. But it has gone like wildfire and and it's so uplifting and inspiring because people often share back what they've done with the things they were given mm. how they've upcycled them how they've repurposed them and so often people share back I love this group 
I love how people just help each other. Um, and so it's become this sort of uplifting thing for people who are a part of it. Um, and it's kind of changing the way they think about their stuff and changing the way they think about their the neighbors that they didn't know in their community. Um, and I had another point about that, but I've lost it. <laughs> Probably <laughs> too far because he needs to wind up. But I think I guess That's I just a good think, example then. Yeah, and I guess I just think you know, it's about like lots and lots of little things like that coming together that create this kind of mycelium that kind of knit together, knit us together in a different way, and make people feel differently about their their place in the system. Um, they don't see it as a new media system or a kind of radical choice. They just see it as I've got some stuff to get rid of or I need something. Yeah. yeah I was going to say a lot of people have been on there saying I'm hosting a Ukrainian family and I need all this stuff. And people oh. just and then they and then they post um, 24 hours later saying, oh, my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed by all the things you want to give. So people are actually seeing their community as a positive sharing place where we can help each other. And they're loving that. Um, so I think they need to see those kind of positive reflections to make them seek out more of that. Yes. Um, yes. Seek out actually we can be something different. Yes. That is such a great example. And, you know, that is what I would call it like a mini can, you know, people coming together through their desire to do something practical, you know, they just need something or they've got something to give and then yeah. it grows into this thing. But you're already talking about its cosmo localism, you know, mm -hmm. It is having a, it's talking about the world at large. Yeah. You know, and this is this yeah. is really, I think, what we're trying to capture is that we, human beings are moving into these spaces. And, you know, we, and eventually one day we'll thank Mark Zuckerberg for all of this mm. because he created the architecture for that. Yeah. But I, I guess I want to, sorry, I've thought of, remember yeah. my other thing, which is just that we, we who are the usual suspects and are maybe thinking about these things more consciously than most, most people. Hmm we need to ensure the threshold for entry is not too high. Yeah, exactly that. Um, and that people yeah. don't need to um, get all these complex ideas, that, that there are ways people can plug in yeah. and get involved and start to, to be part yeah. of this without yeah. Um, yeah. having to yeah. all these things it's, it's, before they do. Yeah, it's the way we look at what people are doing that shifts everything, rather than us telling them what they should do. It's, you know... Yeah, it's our appreciation of what is already happening. Yeah. I think that changes changes it all. Um, I don't know if we have to stop on the hour, but I, I suppose we do. And um, Mike, you know, we, we will be in constant conversation, but, you know, thanks very much for those of you who came today. Really appreciate it. Mervyn, good to see you. Myoma, I know that you gave us a wave earlier on and it was nice to see you too. And thanks very much, Richard. Mm -hmm.